I think that the reason divorce is so painful is the fact that marriage is meant for so, so much. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, God speaks through the prophet and he says, I hate divorce. I think everybody hates divorce. I hate the pain of seeing our friends break up and go through a divorce because we love them both equally and their suffering in so many ways becomes our suffering. And we wish that we could do anything. Is there anything that Fran and I can do to help them, to restore them, to give them a second chance, anything to help? And too often when my wife and I talk about friends who are divorcing, we get to this point where we're aware of the goodness in both of them. Like, she is so good in all these ways, and he's so amazing in all these ways. And why can't they see that about each other anymore? How do you forget something you once felt for another person? Something like love. When did compassion turn into contempt for them? or romance into ridicule, or patience become very, very quick to judge, and kindness, anger. Surely God must hate it when all of that happens. It must break God's heart, God the being in community, perfect love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It must break God's heart. In the book of Genesis, we read about God's original intent for marriage, these words, <clears throat> that a man is to leave his father and his mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Theologians write books and riff on that phrase, one flesh. Two become intimately one. You're not really two separate people anymore, you're one, kind of like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are separate but one. You become intimately and beautifully intertwined with another person. So much one that if she were to hurt him with a word or an action, she'd actually be hurting herself because they're so one. If he spoke words that built her up and helped her flourish and fully be her, he'd actually be helping himself. The Apostle Paul teaches that this unity is so profound in marriage that it's a pointer to, a foretaste of, a reflection of Jesus Christ's union with a human being, with a collection of human beings, that is the church. What you are meant to experience in a marriage is supposed to feel a lot like God's oneness living in you and you feeling one with God, almost like a foretaste of heaven on earth. So yeah, divorce feels so wrong because God's intent for marriage is that big and that right. And this is why God in the Bible and Jesus in the passage we're about to read holds the bar very high when it comes to divorce. This union, pointing to a union, commingling with a union through your union, is what's at stake. And Jesus said these very straight-up words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test Him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Patriarchal society, so the guy obviously back then was the one who made the choice. And back then there were two rabbinic traditions. Uh, one answered the question by saying, yes, for any reason, whatever she does to displease me is enough of a reason to divorce. And then another rabbinic, more conservative tradition said, no, only in the case of adultery uh, would someone be able to divorce. So they're asking him the question, trying to catch Jesus between those two teachings. And Jesus said, Haven't you read 
that at the beginning the Creator made male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Oh, that's where that phrase came from. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. In the Gospel of Mark, the rewriting of that same event ended with, and anyone who divorces his wife, said Jesus, and marries another woman, commits adultery against her. So in the Mark passage, there's no caveats. <clears throat> so, a very, very, very high bar on what constitutes legitimacy in terms of divorce. But the good news is, is that the one who spoke those words and who holds the bar so high is the same one who radically forgives people and loves them in the brokenness and takes a messed up, broken, screwed up relationship in human being and starts anew and forgives and lets go and says, okay, let's go from here. And I love you still. And in fact, there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from my love. When you break any commandment, this is no higher than any other commandment, even though historically in the church, divorce was the, oh. Remember Jesus catching the woman caught in, or they caught the woman caught in adultery and they brought her to Jesus? What did he do? Gentle, quiet in his response to her, loving. God hates divorce and God hates all sin, but God doesn't hate people who divorce or people who sin. God hates the sin and loves the sinner, and to do anything else is a sin and very ungodlike to heap on shame or guilt or ostracizing anybody who's gone through a relational breakup. He's got that woman caught in adultery standing behind her. He who is without sin. And maybe they'd heard already Jesus say, any, woman, any man who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in his heart. He who is without sin, throw the first stone. Just because Jesus wants what's the most for what it's to be, what it's meant to be, doesn't mean that those who go through a breakup should in any way be treated or shamed or guilt-tripped or ostracized. The woman caught in adultery was not pushed away by Jesus. This moment was a moment within which she was drawn into his heart. Another thing I hate about divorce is hearing about it when it's way too late. And as a pastor of a church, I go, come on, seriously, as a church community, ought we not know earlier than this that these people have been going through this crap for this long? Shouldn't a community that's built on a relationship with a promise-keeping, covenant-keeping God be the one place where relational brokenness has its best opportunity to be freely shared and then people brought, be brought around and loved and embraced and given the best chance or at least a communally discerning engagement so that the most can come out of a broken place. I mean, this is a community that teaches about a Jesus who was all about laying down his life for other people, about selflessness, about 
submission to others. The Apostle Paul teaches that to be married is to mutually submit to one another. Women, submit to your husbands. And then the much bigger call to the husbands, submit to your wife like Christ submits to the church. I mean, isn't this the place where we're humble? And, and we know someone who can make us more and more concerned about other in a way that might mitigate or undermine or even heal a relational schism? It's what Christ in community can look like. It's what Christ in a marriage can look like. It's what Christ in you can look like. So a marriage breaking down cynically, I guess it's a sign that all of that potential of Christ in us and in us and in us has failed. Or to some great degree failed. How could any marriage ever break up if the two parties truly are in Christ. This is what kills me and makes it so heartbreaking. And I'm not talking about she's abusive, he's having an affair. I mean, there are circumstances when marriages need to break up. But that ought to be a really, really long-suffering, hard decision to make and in our faith community, a communally embraced decision to make. Another thing that I hate, along with God, I would imagine, about divorce is when the reason for people leaving is some variation of, I just don't feel the romantic love for them anymore. I hate it when people divorce because they've, accepted the lie that our society teaches that love is just a romantic, emotional feeling. When the Bible, a whole book that teaches about what love is, the love of God, in one passage alone, defines it as a much more multi-splendored thing. You've heard it at a thousand weddings. So don't hear it that way again. Hear it new. The Apostle Paul wasn't talking about his experience of love in marriage because he wasn't married. He was speaking of his experience of love in Christ. Love in Christ is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That is what love is like in the person of God. And almost every one of the descriptors that Paul uses there are not about you. He doesn't say love is when you feel like you're really being loved for the way you ought to be loved because you deserve it and you're a victim in this relationship. It's not about you when it comes to love and marriage a lot of the time and yet you're one. So when it's not about you and it's for them, it is about you. And ideally when that's reciprocated, it's about both of you, one. You do flourish when they do. And the lie is, you need to look out for number one, and that's you. Keep looking out for number one. Nobody picked up the old BTO reference in that? I'm old. The wisdom of the Bible is that God looks after those who look after others. Another thing I hate about divorce is when it happens within a marriage and the marriage keeps on going, dead. 
when a husband maybe directs all of his intimate and emotional energies to pornography and robs his wife of what is rightly due her. Or when a wife has nothing but disdain for everything her husband does and is and says. Always a contempt for his weakness or his emotional superficiality or his whatever. And it just sees in their relationship with each other. Or when all he ever sees in her is physical flaws or psychological flaws or where she's not perfect. So it's not hard enough to live in a world where so much pressure to be perfect is there. I mean, is it any better that people are totally divorced from one another and still stay together? And while that can be a very convenient excuse to too quickly part, it's understandable. And I've engaged a lot of messy divorce situations. And at first you go, no! And then after weeks and meetings and prayer, you go, yeah, this is done. This idea of living in a dead relationship It's not just for those for whom divorce is imminent or has already happened within a marriage. It's happening in all of our relationships if you're with somebody. Every time you think that thought for another person, every time you get angry and lash out and destroy them and kill them with your words, we're all falling short. I hate it when that happens too. I hate it when you see what happens to the kids. I hate the anger and the vitriol and all the money that's spent on lawyers and the time in court. I hate the huge emotional costs that people have to pay. I hate that they had dreams. No one ever goes into a marriage thinking that divorce is going to happen. To see that dream shattered in people. I hate seeing hope seemingly abandoned and hearts torn. So like God, I, we hate divorce. And let me tell you that a few decades ago, it was nothing other than by the grace of God that I didn't go through a divorce. may be there, but for the grace of God, go a few of you as well. And through that grace and that forgiveness and that moment, I got a new heart and a new life. And Christ in me, patient. And I I half expected to hear a laugh from one of my family members saying patient, (laughs) but more patient than I ever was and more aware of others than ever before, and on a journey and path of being made new and forgiven and restored, was given a second chance. He did that. The same one who stood beside the woman and gave her a second chance. The same one who spoke hard words about divorce said that. And in the forgiving moment, and I think this is the number one tool when it comes to keeping a marriage going, the ability to forgive, in the forgiving moment before God, a life-changing and transforming, making new of you, you find what you need to forgive in the context of a relationship. To forgive people from your past, your family, others who've hurt you in other relationships, and let them go, so that you have more emotional space to be a human being in the relationship that you're in. To forgive your spouse when they inevitably screw up. To forgive yourself when you inevitably screw up. To be able to accept forgiveness from other people if that's where you struggle. I can give forgiveness, but I can never receive it. I mean, forgiveness in all of those ways, working in a relationship, is what it takes. 
all of them empowered by a knowing, forgiving relationship with God. Jesus said, Paul said, put up that next quote. Paul said, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So if you want to save your marriage and save your life, draw near to the God who forgives you and get a new heart and get a new start and learn to hope again and hang on because you're right in the middle of it and learn what marriage really means and forgiveness and love so that when you enter into it, you'll have the tools. The tools, you'll have him and he'll have you both of you. And that's not going to guarantee that every marriage flourishes or is saved or doesn't end in divorce, but by the grace of God, it is our best chance until that day when everything is made new. From the book of Revelation, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. And they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. We'll be one with him. The two shall become one. And there he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, and no more conflict, and no more divorce, and no more psychological torture, and no more pain. No more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Let's pray. Seems, Lord, it's just so complex and confusing. And so now what do we do? And how do we handle what's happened or what's happening or what might happen? How do we live together as married people if that is our relational status? It seems we need a day to day, ever present sense of your spirit leading, guiding forgiving, renewing, restoring, humbling, emboldening, giving clarity, uh, listening to your voice saying which way to go, who to be, what to do. Not as some kind of situational ethic, but because uh, this world is so messed and Marriages are so broken in many circumstances. And the situa situation is so desperate, we have no choice but to cry out to you and to raise our hands and depend. So bring your wisdom to your people, to everyone here, Surround us with your grace and your love, your forgiveness, your hope, your renewal, your second chance heart. And make us more and more and more uh, individually in knowing you, collectively in knowing you, within marriages in knowing you, one. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.